Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kate. I'm an educator and a parent of child children with disability. And I've also got Julie with me. Hi, Julie. Hi, Kate. I'm Julie. I'm a speech pathologist. And today um, I'll start off by doing our acknowledgement of country. I am joining you today from Darug Nation and Julie is joining you today from the Gadi Nation. Okay, so Reframing Disability acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And Julie, you're on the road today. You're in a different setting today. We That's were just right. having a talk off camera about um, how we're all transitioning now that um, our state has opened up a little bit. Uh, we're able to move around a little bit more. So thank you um, for joining us today from up there and um, welcome everyone. Uh, we wanted to meet today to talk about these new updates that we have had. We knew that there'd be updates um, after we went live last week. So the updates that we have this week, we'll, we have a new Premier and he and the, his team have made the decision to return students earlier than expected. So as planned, kindergarten year one and year 12 are returning from Monday, the 18th of October. And on the 25th of October, all other students are returning. So that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different. It is an update, Kate. You know, but, you know, in these times, we all need to, you know, be as flexible as we can and adapt as the situation changes. So, Kate, I was just on that theme, was just going to ask you, last week we had a lot of questions from families um, that were wondering whether it was going to be possible to keep their children from home due to their complex medical conditions. Um, I'm understanding that you might have some new information on that. Yeah, I do have some information which might be exciting for some parents because there were a lot of parents that were quite anxious about sending their students back um, in line with the uh, ret return to face-to-face -face learning. So I've done a little bit of de digging and students um, that are in the level three plus return which is most students, I'll read them here. This is from the Department of Education website. So if your child goes to a private school, they might have a different um, strategies around supporting your child. So once again, it's always best to check in with your school first. Um, but schools that are under the level three plus schools, and you can find that information if that's your school on the Department of Education website, um, it applies to schools in Greater Sydney, including the Blue Mountains and Wollongong, uh, Bathurst, Burke, Broken Hill, Central Coast, Cessnock, Dubbo, Yorubadala, uh, Goulburn, Kayama, Lake Macquarie, Lithgow, Maitland, Newcastle, Port Stephens, Queanbeyan, Shell Harbour, Shell Haven and Windy Caribbean. Okay, so these LGAs are, are considered Level 3 plus schools. And they're under the orders to return to face-to-face -face learning from next week. So students from those LGAs that cannot return to school because they're vulnerable children or they have um, a medical condition, and this is backed by health professionals, will continue to receive one unit of work in line with the current guidelines delivered by online learning or learning from home packs. Okay, so this can be facilitated by your school and they're encouraging schools to work collaboratively um, to support learners that can't return to face-to-face -face learning. They're also going to um, structure classroom deliver delivery to enable time to support students learning from home. So your school is going to be navigating this in their own way so that's why it's best to communicate with your school. But what is fantastic is we now have some support for parents that have been anxious, Julie, because there's been a lot of um, anxious parents around, particularly 
around the limited access to vaccinations, something that I can talk to um, about later as well. But um, there are a few other updates from our families, for our families, and I can go through these. I think the first thing, and this will help you prepare your child, is cohorting. We spoke about this last week, Julie, about cohorting and that um, interactions between students in different cohorts are going to be limited. Now, the reasoning behind that is because of contact tracing. So if there is a positive case at your school, the school will be able to trace um, and provide that information to New South Wales Health. That's why they're trying to minimise the movement. Um, they want students learning and playing in these cohorts, which means that they'll be having break time within these cohorts. And it'll also enable um, an opportunity to minimise transmission between cohorts. So that's the reasoning behind that, which I hope is, um, is helpful to our parents. In terms of other updates, we've already spoken a lot um, about that, Julie, but one thing that is on our list to discuss today is mask wearing. So because the Premier made the announcement last week about the changes in the mask wearing um, legislation, I just want parents to know that at this stage, it is still mandatory for teachers to be wearing masks. So that, that hasn't changed. Businesses might change. Did you have other information around that, Julie? So, Kate, I had a look at the health orders um, towards the end of, well, after, after the close of business Friday um, last week, and there are reasons where a mask can be removed, particularly mm -hmm. for therapy. You know, if you've got a child with a hearing impairment, the teacher is allowed to remove the mask. Mm -hmm. according to the public health orders. For speech therapy, you know, if we need to cue a sound um, visually using our own mouth, we can remove a mask for that reason. However, it's still advisable wherever possible to wear a mask um, when, when you're not alone in an indoor setting other than if you're at home. So my understanding is that most of the time, Teachers will be wearing masks. However, you know, if your child really needs intervention and supports that, you know, where, where the, there's queuing from the area that would be covered by a mask, it may be possible for either a see-through mask or to have the mask, the, the adult remove the mask for a short period of time. Okay, that's good to know. And, Julie, some parents are still concerned that their children won't be able to effectively communicate with their teachers um, as their teacher will be wearing a mask. So how can parents and teachers support children who need that communication support? So for the grown-ups, it's about exaggerating your affect. Your affect figure. So if you would normally show, you know, you're slightly pleased, exaggerate that. Open your eyes a little wider. Make sure your voice is really carrying that affect along with your whole body. So when we talk about nonverbal communication, Kate, we're talking about our not just our face cues, but our face, our voice, and our whole body cues. So your whole body conveys your feeling, and your your children will will pick up on this, particularly if we use slightly exaggerated affect when we're communicating with them to overcome what is lost with the mouth and nose covered. Some of our kids really over, over rely or have been taught to rely on the mouth. So if your child's one of those, maybe it's time to point out the eye cues, you know, people's eyes look different whether they're happy, sad or angry. Talk about voice cues and intonation if your child's able to understand that. Talk about body cues, so whether someone's got their head on the side or whether their shoulders are down or whether their chest is out. Or by drawing your child's attention to these cues as well as the grown-ups being aware to exaggerate, you know, the, the emotion and use exaggerated gesture. 
we're not talking anything extreme. We t- we're just talking about slightly exaggerated um, to support those children who are still learning to pick up on those cues or might have previously relied a lot on the face cues. Yeah, and Julie, one thing that I notice myself doing, um, as I've shared, I'm a parent of children with disability. So one strategy I use is nonverbal cues, including keyword sign. So I noticed myself when we were out on the weekend and I had my mask on and I have two children with um, communication, well, uh, expressive and receptive language delays. Um, So they find it difficult to communicate with me when I do have the mask on. And I know that I don't have to wear a mask when I'm with them, but I'm just trying to protect everyone, including them, uh, and keep wearing my mask. But I noticed that I was using a lot more of keyword sign. So stop, yes, um, quiet voice. What else did I notice I was using? Oh, we use waiting hands. So we stand with our waiting hands. And then it was good, well done when you were following you know, my support and understand what I was saying. So is that something that our parents can do too? If families know keyword sign, go ahead. And if your child's aware of what it means, use that with your your child. Keyword sign does use a lot of um, signs that other families might just use as a natural gesture. You know, do you want a drink? Are you hungry? Are you tired? Or do you want to sleep? All of these things, I mean, you know, if your child's not a keyword sign user using the signs for yes and no, that's optional because you can say yes or no with your head in a way your child understands. So use the verbal prompts or uh, gestures as we all would use, but just exaggerate them a little more. So do you, do you want a drink? Yes or no? Making sure we're giving our children plenty of opportunities to pick up on those gestures, you know? Oh, you know, do you, are you tired? Do you want to go to bed? You know, if a child doesn't know a keyword sign, you know, unless you're planning on introducing it for the long term, you know, it's not going to necessarily be super helpful. The, on, on first presentation, but those natural gestures are the way to go. Most most parents do the stop, you know, come back, you know, all of those natural ones that the kids have seen hundreds of times before. We're going to be relying a lot more of on those, particularly if under a mask our voice is a little muffled. Mm. You know, an adult with a muffled voice on top of a child with a, you know, ear infection or some glue ear, on top of, you know, everything else, the loss of the, you know, the mouth cues, you know, it is going to make it necessary to provide some additional supports to your child to support their understanding and use of language. And then relaying this information to their teacher as well. So something that um, has been learned at school is the waiting arms. You know, and it, it's been, it was taught at school explicitly as a social skill, use your waiting arms. And I then started using it at, at home because my son had to be told and shown and taught explicitly how to wait. Um, and, and it serves me so well when we're out in the community. Another one is, you know, finish. But oh, as you said, these should be taught prior to returning to school or if if that's something that you implement in your family anyway and then communicated with the um the teachers and support staff that are working with your child so that they can utilize these in the classrooms as well that's right and your child might actually be using some signs that they've made up all by themselves or you might use some signs that your family have just made up You know, if your child understands these well, photograph them, make a little, you know, visual dictionary of the signs your child uses or your family uses and share these with the teacher because your child's been with you and been communicating mostly with you for the past three months.
Yeah. It is really important that if your child or you have developed some signs that may or may not be those usually used or those otherwise documented in a dictionary, take some photos. You know, make a make make it make a um an ebook or an online album of those photos and share those key signs or gestures with your teacher because your teacher's you know going to need to try and pick up, you know, after ha- not having seen your child for three months. Yeah, and that that's something we were talking about last week and having that open communication with your child's teacher and setting your child up for success in the classroom a perfect example of sharing information and strategies that you've been using at home that have been supportive for your child. Some families might be using checklists to complete their online learning. Uh, So sharing these strategies of what worked well for you at home with your child's teacher for them to implement once they're back at school. Now, Julie, we have had a question come in over the course of the last week. And this is around supporting our child's emotions. Uh, Some children are becoming anxious about going back to school. So the question, I'll read it out. My child is scared of getting COVID. How can I put their mind at ease ease, to support them as they go back to school? In this situation where a child is fearful of getting COVID, in a lot of the time, their parents might be fearful of getting COVID as well. So, I mean, I think it's a common fear right now in the community. What we're saying to the adults is take this reintegration into, you know, new COVID normal at your own pace. Now, the only thing that, you know, that where a timeline is actually set for children is around their return to school. There's no necessarily compulsory timeline for when your child might return to swimming lessons or start playing at the park more often or any of those things. So, you know, in terms of reducing your child's anxiety about getting COVID, you can talk about, you know, we're we're going to go slowly. We're, We're going to be careful. We're going to go slowly. Talk to your child about hygiene precautions hand hand washing and things that they can do to feel safe. Sometimes when children are feeling scared of something, showing them how they can be in control can be really helpful. So reminding children to wash their hands if they've touched their nose or face, to wash their hands before eating and after toileting. And, you know, you might even want your child to wash their hands immediately on return home after school. So many of the schools will be, you know, teaching children to use hand sanitizer or hand washing on arrival at school in the morning to ensure that germs from home into the classroom are minimised. It may be helpful for you as a family to do the reverse. So on return home, your child immediately washes their hands and changes out of their school uniform into some play clothes. And by doing this, you're going to minimise the risk of any virus that might have been at school coming home as well and by doing this and maintaining really high hygiene standards hopefully your child is going to be given the strategies they can use to minimize their own risk until the young children have the opportunity to be vaccinated so you know we can do things give give the child some control you know show them what they can do but if your child is very anxious. So, for instance, if you noticed significant changes in appetite, toileting, or sleep, you know, very anxious children might not feel like eating, might not be going to sleep. There might be a regression with toileting. Notice all of those things for signs of a very significant level of anxiety. Depending on your own child, um, their level of understanding of, you know, what's happening and their ability to talk about it, your approach might be different. So seek advice from your healthcare practitioners. For a child that might benefit from a social story, speak with your allied health team. For a child where this sort of anxiety may lead to, you know, 
constipation or some other medical condition to do with the change in diet, speak with your doctor. You know, get, get the advice and support to best support your child, either to manage the anxiety or to help allay some of those fears. It's just it's really, really important, though, that you tune into your child. Um, be understanding and supportive of those fears if your child voices them and try and maintain sameness. Routine and predictability is helpful. Avoid any unnecessary changes and make sure you help your child know ahead of time if something needs to change for a particular reason. I love that, Julie, and I love your analogy um, that you've been sharing with us over the series of sameness and highlighting what is going to be the same. And it's actually because, as you know, I work for um, the Department of Ed. It's something that we've been um, saying in our school environments is that there is a lot that's staying the same. And so we just want to project onto the children that a lot of it is going to stay the same and just highlight what's going to be different. So thank you for that analogy. I absolutely love it. Now, I'll, we'll move on now um, to some questions that we've had from families. So one of the questions from our families, Julie, is will my child's therapist be able to go back on site? And under the level three plus, um, is this looking like it's going to be possible? I believe it's technically possible, but on a case-by-case -case basis. So under level three plus, my understanding is wherever possible therapy should happen away from school in another setting. However, if the therapy is critical to a child's developmental needs, your school may, you know, may allow a therapist to visit school if it's not possible to provide that in any other setting. However, there's a chance that your therapist might not be permitted, even if they're permitted on school grounds, they may not be permitted in your child's classroom. They might not be able to provide additional advice and support to the child's teacher while they're on site. And this is all to do with that cohorting and, and trying to minimise cross-contamination or the virus spreading between cohorts. So many therapists particularly if a therapist is, is attending more than one school per day, it is likely that the school, you know, might want to pop some restrictions around that. But once again, case by case and um, talk, talk to your school, talk to your teacher, talk to your therapist. Your therapist might be able to arrange to see your child before school, a 7.30 or an 8.30 a.m. appointment. Your school might be happy for your child to finish up half an hour early to get a 2 o'clock or 2.30 appointment rather than have the therapist come into school, particularly while we're on the level three plus restrictions. You know, that these restrictions might change over time as immunisation rates increase. Your school might drop back down to a level three, at which time there's more, you know, might be more opportunities for that to occur. Yeah, and so if you are a therapist going on site in a New South Wales school under these level three plus restrictions or strategies, um, one thing that you might have to do or you will have to do is sign in with the school's QR code and wear a face mask when you are on site. But as you said, Julie, um, it is a case by case situation and it is going to be changing. I'd imagine um, oh. we are on that level three plus at the moment. But as you said, case numbers go down, vaccination rate go, goes up, we will move to another we'll level three. Um, and if you want more information of what this looks like, it's all available on the Department of Education website. Um, there is another question here, Julie. It's probably might have to be our last one for the day because it's almost 12.30. Um, what will happen if there is a positive case at my school? This is something that um, we talked about in um, our other tips uh, and video series that we did. But what will happen if there is a positive case is, is the school will have to go through to the, which cohort it affects. Um, they'll have to notify the families and the children that have been affected. Um, the school may uh, be closed and deemed non-operational for cleaning. Um, and then once the cleaners have been in, 
and minimise the risk, it will be operational again. Um, that's the current advice that we have. That might change, but that's how um, schools are going to be affected if there is a positive case at school. Do you have more to add, Julie? Yeah, it's okay. Basically, if there's a positive case at school, we're just going to need to list what the school tells us to do. Yeah, all the communication is going to come from the school. Um, New South Wales Health will be assisting the schools to manage um, how they communicate to parents, but most of the communication will come through the school and that will determine um, if your child was a casual or a close contact um, it will determine the period that they will need to remain isolated or it will determine um, if they were affected at all because your child might not be affected because of cohorting. Um, they may not have been at the same place at the same time as your child. Um, so you really have to make sure that the school has your correct details make sure they've got your correct phone number, your correct email address, because a lot of the communication will be via email. So that's one thing to make sure that you're the primary contact. Um, I had to update mine because we has had a positive case at my son's school before the holidays and the communication went to my husband who was at work and didn't see it <laughs> so, um, until I was um, notified by another parent so I had to update the details to make sure that I was the primary contact so it's just making sure that you cross all your t's and dot all your i's um, you're in communication with your child's teacher they have all your um, contact information I mean Julie there's people that have moved throughout this pandemic as well that's right you know I mean I'm ho hopefully Families know that, you know, all, all of this being, being ready for a transition, it's about the school being ready to accept your child. It's about you being ready to take your child. It's about your child being ready to return. So, it, you know, we all need to be, you know, we all need to be ready together. So part of the grown-up's role it, to have the school ready for, for the return is to make sure that the school's got all the appropriate information that they've gathered or they know that the school might not know. Mm. And it's the school's job to share the information they know, so what the new rules are going to be with the parent. And by the parent and school sharing the, sharing the information together, that helps make it much more ready for your child to return. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, Julie. Your insight is invaluable. And one thing I did do last week was try on those school uniforms and we needed a bigger size. So I'm glad I had some time to prepare for that. Um, so thank you for your time today, Julie, and um, we'll see everyone next week. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Thank Bye. you.